All right, so looking at number three, uh, again, we're going to start with the expectation that we've got a predicate here. And uh, this, uh, at least um, at first impression, this new suffix, this would seem to be something that we would expect on a verb. Uh, and so we're going to anticipate that this is our verb. But again, it's got too many letters for it to be uh, just the root. So we have to figure out what, what's extra to get back to that root so that we can translate. And so again, starting from the end, because usually you're more likely to have a suffix on a verb than a prefix. Uh, we, we ask, does shurik ever get added as a suffix? It does. There's, there's, a, there's many times. Um, but if we take shurik, we've still got too many. So what about noon shurik? That would get us down to three. And of course, noon shurik does get added to verbs. Uh, in the Cal Perfect, it's the one CP suffix. <coughs> so if we take that off, we're left with yod, resh, aleph. And that happens to be a, uh, a verb that we've learned, yare, in this form with the sere theme vowel is the lexical form of he was afraid or he feared. And so if yare is he feared, then yarenu is going to be we feared or we were afraid. And so um, we've got a Cal Perfect, one CP form of yare, which in this instance probably means something like we were afraid or we feared. That's about all we can get grammatically out of this word, so we just move to the next word. The next word, uh, again, in normal Hebrew word order, if we've got the main verb first and we've got a third-person verb, we would expect the subject to come next. We don't have a third-person verb, we've got a first-person verb. And if we have an explicit subject for a first-person verb, it can really only be uh, ani or anohi for I or anachnu for we. There, you're not going to have a, a noun that is the subject of a first-person verb. So this wouldn't be the noun. This would be maybe a direct object. Um, but we don't see the definite direct object marker, so we got to think a little bit about what this might be. Now, what I do see here is I see a Lamed preposition. Uh, and I think it's Lamed preposition because I've got the Lamed patach. Now, that would normally indicate a... Um, that would normally indicate a definite, uh, a definite article if I have a dogesh in the second letter. Of course, I don't have a dogesh in the second letter because it's an ayin, and the ayin can't take a dogesh. Well, in that case, I would expect the patach to lengthen to a kametz. That doesn't happen here. So maybe this isn't the definite article. But when would I ever get lamed with a patach if this is the lamed preposition and have no dogish over here? There's a couple instances. There are some um, what we call virtual doubling for the definite article, where instead of compensatory lengthening, you just get the patach. And usually I think that occurs with hey and chet, but that's not what we have here. What I do notice, though, is we have the corresponding short vowel and reduced vowel, or short vowel and hatef vowel. So what's probably happened here is the lamed preposition has been added to ava, avor, um, and since avor has this hatef vowel, the appropriate, va uh, the appropriate vowel, whether I have a uh, definite article or not, is going to be the patak here. So the patak is not necessarily indicative of a definite article. Uh, we should just read it as a lamed preposition attached to a word that begins with a hatef patak. That's why the lamed takes the patak. So if we take the lamed off, we've got avor, avor, and we have to think, is this a word that we've seen before? It's not the lexical form of a word that we've seen before. And the only reason I know that is memory. Um, so you've got a little bit of an advantage working through Furtado because you know that he's only going to give you really words that you've seen before. If you were working through the Hebrew text itself, it might be a little bit <laughs> a little bit trickier to determine whether or not this is a word you should know because you're obviously going to get words that you haven't learned yet. But in the safety of Furtado's exercises, we can rest assured that this is, a, and this is somehow related to vocabulary that we've had. And since I don't remember ever learning Avor, I can think about, well, what are my root letters? Ayin, Beit, Reish. Where have I seen Ayin, Beit, Reish before? And at the very least, I've seen this in a verb, Avar. Avar is the, he went over, he trespassed, something like that. And so if I think about that verbal root, and I look at the vowel pattern that I have, I ask myself, is there a situation where this verb would be conjugated this way? I don't have any prefixes or suffixes. So at this point, you know, in the past, the only time we had a verb with no prefixes or suffixes was the CalPerfect 3MS form. But now in this, um, sorry, I just want to make sure, um, oh, okay, I just want to make sure someone wasn't emailing me about the video conference. <coughs> so now what we've got here is um, a var in a form, what we've just learned was the infinitive form, and the infinitive is built off the imperfect, which has a prefix, but basically to get the infinitive construct, you take the cal imperfect 3ms form for the most part, and you just remove the prefix. So now the infinitive is also a form that has no prefix or suffix. So right now we know of the cal perfect 3ms, that has no prefix or suffix, and we know of the infinitive construct and the infinitive absolute have no prefix or suffix. So it's definitely not the cal perfect 3ms because it doesn't have the correct vowel pattern. If I think to myself, is this a vowel pattern that makes sense for the infinitive, um, sometimes we refer to the infinitives as the infinitoves because usually that second root letter will have an O-class vowel. Now the reason why it often has an O-class vowel is because it's built off of the imperfect, which often has an O-class vowel. Uh, and I say often because it's not universal. But here I do have an O-class vowel, which makes sense of an infinitove, and I have a reduced vowel, 
a Hatef vowel in R1. Now we're used to seeing Shavaz here for the infinitive, but again, the gutturals don't like vocal Shavaz, well, especially vocal Shavaz. They prefer to have the Hatef vowels, the reduced vowels. Uh, and so that would explain why I have a Hatef Patak, Hatef patak underneath of the ayin in an infinitive form. Uh, I know that it is not the infinitive absolute because the infinitive absolute tends to have a full vowel under R1, okay? It doesn't always have a holum vav in the theme vowel. Sometimes it'll only have the holum, but it will definitely not have a shava under R1 if it's the infinitive absolute. Furthermore, if it's the infinitive absolute, it won't have a, a prepositional prefix. Uh, now, when I said earlier that this root form doesn't have any prefixes, I mean verbal prefixes. I'm not talking about the preposition here. So what, what I see then is lamed preposition and avor, which comes from avar, but this happens to be the cal infinitive construct form. Does all of that make sense as to how I figured out what la avor is? Um, I'll give Ben a chance. If you have any questions about that, let me know because uh, I kind of meandered a bit there, but I want to make sure that that process makes sense of how to get that. All right, assuming we're good there, we have parsed this out. We know as much grammatical information about this as we can. When we come back through, we'll ask how this infinitive form is functioning in the sentence, but for now, we'll just we'll move on to the next. What I see next is I see my et particle, which indicates I've got a definite direct object marker following it. I'm sorry, that I have a definite direct object following it. But again, et, we don't do anything with it. It doesn't have any lexical meaning, um, semantic value. It's just a function marker. So then I look at Torah. And this looks very similar to Torah. I, I would hope that you would recognize that this is from Torah. But of course, it's got the Patak Tav ending. And that's the ending that we commonly see in feminine singular nouns when they're in the construct form. All right, so whatever this is, this is noun of something. Now, we know it's Torah, so we can say instruction of whatever the absolute is. So I go to the next word and I have to find out, is this the absolute or is this another construct in the construct chain? And when I look at this word, I see the word Yahweh. I see the word for, you can translate it Yahweh, Adonai, which isn't a translation, but I'm okay with you using Adonai, or just the Lord. I, I'm okay with a lot of various translations of this. I'll, I'll just say Yahweh because that's, <coughs> I don't know, a little more literal, I guess. Um, <coughs> so this is Torat Yahweh or Torat Adonai. Um, I don't have a definite article on Adonai, but that doesn't mean it's not definite. Adonai, or, or Yahweh here, this is a personal name, and personal names by default, just the nature of what a personal name is, it is definite by default. Because a personal name, obviously, is referring to a specific individual rather than Yahweh in general. It's specifically Yahweh. And so this word doesn't need a definite article because it's just, it, it can't be indefinite. It's always referring to a specific person. So that means that since the absolute is definite, the construct also has to be definite. So we get this phrase here, the instruction, singular, of Yahweh. All right, so that's about all we can do grammatically with this part. We'll move on. Next, we have key. <coughs> I've never had a good mnemonic for the conjunction key, but just this week as I was scrolling through the... Uh, um, I'm not going to bother with sharing the screen, I guess. But if you go to... Um, let me at least pull it up so I can see it. If you go to the Hebrew vocabulary spreadsheet... Uh, and that link is under uh, important course documents, I think. I did add a mnemonic here. Now, you tell me whether or not you think this is helpful, because I've never had one, and it's always been annoying, because key has so many different meanings. Uh, the primary meanings for key are something like because or for, because key will introduce an explanatory clause, and usually in English we use the, the words for or because to introduce an explanatory clause. The other thing that key can introduce is a content clause, which would be something like, he told me that he would go to the fair tomorrow. Well, that he would go to the fair tomorrow is the content of what he told me. He is often used to introduce content or direct speech or something like uh, something like that. So if the two primary meanings are explan explanation, like introducing an explanation or introducing content, and the way that we would translate those would be either because or for or that, he told me that, such and such, the mnemonic that I came up with is this. Is the key for that door? And so you get for and that in there. I don't want students to think that key means for that. It doesn't mean for that, it just means either for or that. Um, but I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel for, for mnemonics and memory aids because conjunctions are just so hard to uh, apply that to. But hopefully that's helpful uh, in remembering what key means. It has two primary functions and you can't really prioritize one over the other. I'm sure one of them is more frequent, but you gotta be ready for both key introducing both an explanation, I should say either, key introducing either an explanation or introducing content. Um, so in that, in that way, we're, we're looking at key here and we're thinking to ourselves, okay, is key introducing content or is it introducing an explanation of what came before? And without even knowing what it is, if I had to guess here, I would say it's explanation because there's no, generally speaking, when it's introducing content, you're going to have some sort of verb of 
verb of content, some verb of speech or verb of communication or something like that. So uh, I'm going to guess it's cause or explanation, but we'll see what happens. So key, I don't, I don't even translate this until I get through the end of the sentence. I just know that those are the two options. All right, so what I have next is yishpot. Sorry, yishpot. Yishpot here, um, only because I recognize the root. I'm trying to think through your eyes. If maybe you don't recognize the root, what would you do with this? Because you don't necessarily know, is this going to be a verb? Is this going to be a noun, an adjective, or anything like that? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this root, or I'm going to look at this word, rather, and I'm going to try to pick out a root. Um, you can do this with nouns, uh, oftentimes with adjectives, because adjectives will be built off of uh, verbal roots sometimes. But just if you're not sure what you're looking at, just look at the letters and, and ask yourself, do I see a triconsonantal root in here? Do I see a three-letter root somewhere that is familiar? Or even if it's not familiar, do I see what might be a three-letter root and then everything else I can explain as suffixes or prefixes? So when I look at that and I, I see these four letters here, I immediately think that Yod is, especially when I see Yod here, I'm thinking that's going to be a Kalim perfect prefix. All right, and so if that's the case, I'd be left with shen pei tav. And if this is a Kalim perfect prefix, then shen pei tav should be a verbal root. Now, if you haven't learned shen pei tav yet, you can always go to your lexicon and look up that root, uh, and you'll find that this is the root for in the Cal perfect he judged. Okay, well, if this is he judged, and I've got a yod hirik, that must mean that this is the Cal imperfect three ms form. He will judge. And then the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check all my vowels and make sure that that lines up with what I would expect from a CalPerfect 3MS. So I have the yod hirik that I expect from CalPerfect 3MS. I have no suffix, which I don't expect to have a suffix with CalPerfect 3MS. I've got a shava under R1, which I expect with the CalPerfect 3MS. Uh, the reason why I have a dogesh in R2 is because I've got a bagad kafat letter that is preceded by a consonant sound rather than a vowel sound. This is not a doubling dogesh. This is not a strong dogesh. This is just a weak dogesh in a Bagad Kafat letter because it doesn't have a vowel sound immediately before it. Then I've got the holum vowel, which I expect in the Cal Imperfect, uh, and I've got my top. So everything makes sense. This is a verb, <coughs> and it is conjugated as a Cal Imperfect 3MS. It's going, that doesn't necessarily de decide for me whether this is functioning as uh, introducing content or explanation yet, because I could have a verb either way. So I still have to keep an open mind here, but this is a verb in a um, uh, in a new clause. We'll say that. All right. So what do I have after this verb? Well, I've got my at marker. So that tells me whatever comes after this uh, is going to be the definite object of this verb. So what does come after this? Well, I've got kol. Uh, I, when I learned this word, I learned it as kaf holam lamed. It's important for you to know that this is not a kametz. All right. Kaf holam lamed is a closed syllable. But when it's in construct like this, it loses its accent. Remember, construct gives up its accent to the next word. I shouldn't say the next word. It gives up its ac uh, accent to the absolute. Uh, so basically any construct word, it's going to lose its accent. Well, anytime you have this symbol, this ver or this vowel symbol in a closed, unaccent unaccented syllable, it's not kametz, it's kametz chatuf. All right, so this is kol, which means all, but it's all of. All right, it's connected with whatever this word is. So um, I forgot to translate what this would be. If Shafat is he judged, then Yishpot is going to be he will judge. I've got my definite direct object marker. I've got my adjective kol, which means all. It's in construct, so this is all of. And now I've got my final word that I have to figure out. And I'll tell you right now, if I've got a, a definite direct object marker and kol is an adjective, I need a noun somewhere because kol isn't the noun. Uh, now, as an adjective, it might be functioning substantively as a noun. But again, that's not what's happening. This is my noun. So even though this is a really funky looking word, I know it's a noun because it's got the definite direct object marker attached. And knowing that it's a noun, the next thing that sticks out at me is this yod vav ending. Anytime you see a yod vav ending like this, you need to be thinking that this is almost certainly the third person masculine singular suffix, uh, we can call it the possessive suffix, on a plural noun. Okay, so this is a possessive suffix on a plural noun, and the particular suffix that it is is the, the third masculine singular. So this is his something. So his what? Well, if I take this off, I've got three root letters, ayin, bait, dalit. Now, is that a root that I recognize, ayin, bait, dalit? Well, we had the verb avad before, um, but avad is tricky because avad, as I say avad, there's actually two verbs, two roots that we've learned so far. We've learned avad with an aleph and avad with a, um, yeah, and I actually mistranslated it up here. Avad with an aleph and avad with an ayin, okay? So we've got the ayin form here. Up here I said that avad means... Um, I didn't, nope, this isn't Avad, this is Avar. So I got this one right, Avar, trespass, or, or pass over. Uh, Avad, though, if it is the ayin, it means to serve, or he served. If it's the aleph, it means to, um, to perish, or to pass away, or something like that. So don't get Avad with an aleph and Avad with an ayin confused. Uh, make sure that you distinguish between those. But I've got some weird vowels going on here. I don't quite know what to make of this. 
it's okay if you don't know quite what to make of it because you've really figured out everything you need to know. You know this is a noun, and it's related to the verbal idea of he served. Well, we learned avad, but we also learned evid. Evid is the noun for servant or slave. So this is going to be that noun evid with the vav, or I'm sorry, with the yod vav ending, the yod vav possessive suffix attached, so that it becomes his servant. Now I can go ahead and explain to you quickly what's going on with the vowels here, but I just want you to know that even if you don't know what's going on with the vowels, you're still okay because you've got all the information out of it that you need. So technically what this is, is the suffix itself is kametz yod vav. That's what has been added to the end here. When we add that to the end, all of the syllables are now shifting in their accent. So with evid, we had a segel, and it was in an open syllable, so we had a short vowel in an open syllable. That was okay because that syllable was accented, evid. You can have a short vowel in an open syllable if that syllable is accented, and that's what we had. Well, now this is not only no longer accented, this is now what we call propretonic. This is two syllables away from the accent. And so when you've got a, a syllable like this, generally speaking, you're going to reduce this syllable. And that's why we've gone down to the hatef patak, because again, ayin has a strong preference for the aleph. And so if it's going to pick a reduced vowel, it's going to pick the hatef patak. <coughs> Excuse me. What about the bait here? The bait used to have a segel, evid. Why does the bait go to a kametz? Well, the reason why is because this is now classified as an open pretonic syllable. And when you have an open pretonic syllable, Hebrew wants that syllable to have a long vowel. And obviously, evid, well, again, Potato calls it a medium vowel. But evid, uh, the segel, was a short vowel, so that didn't work. So that's why they have to uh, beef this up to a kametz. But again, you don't need to know the ins and outs of Hebrew accentuation, uh, accenting. You don't need to know all of the vowel changes that occur. You can get the info you need from this just by recognizing the yod vav ending, that this must be a noun, and that this noun is related to the verbal stem uh, or the verbal root, avad. So that gives you the noun evid. All right, so we've gone through here. Goodness, we're probably like, what are we, like 30 minutes in? Um, I said I didn't want to slow it down, but again, you, when you guys are still learning the, the process of translating sentences, I want to be as clear as I can. So here, let's go through now and ask our function questions. We asked all of our grammar questions. Let's ask our syntax questions now. So this uh, first word we decided this is our main verb. Um, it represents the predicate. Um, and then after that, we've got an infinitive construct. Infinitive constructs can function in a few different ways. They can... Um, with a prepositional phrase, they can modify the verb. Um, without a prepositional phrase, they could constitute um, a subject or an object. Here, if we, if we just translate them, it's easier for us to think through the function if we're thinking in English. So we have, we were afraid, and then we have to, uh, lamed indicates purpose, or um, it could just indicate, um, what, what do we call this? Uh, a complementary infinitive. So this, um, this would be something like, we were afraid to trespass. We were afraid to and again, trespass makes sense because what we're trespassing would be the um, Torah, the instruction of Adonai. Here we see that the et, the, the direct object here, is not the direct object of the verb, Yahweh. It's not we were afraid of the instruction of Yahweh. Uh, et Torah Adonai is the direct object of La Avod. We were afraid to trespass the instruction of Adonai, of Yahweh. Then we have key. So again, we're going to leave key for now. Key is probably one of the last things we're going to translate. We're going to make sense of this clause. Yish pot, we decided this was um, he will judge. And then et is going to tell you whom or what he will judge. All his servants. Uh, now, again, for Eved, we, we're used to seeing, uh, what would it be? Evadim, I think. Evadim would be servants, plural. But um, we don't use that hierarchy mem ending when we've got this possessive suffix on there. So even though this looks singular, it's just evid, we don't really see a sign of the plural, the suffix itself tells us that the noun is plural, because if this were singular, it would be uh, evado, uh, rather than, and then, then we would probably still, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the vowel pointing would be there, but it would be the whole and ending if this were singular. So we've got this phrase, he will judge all of his servants. How does he will judge all of his servants relate to, we were afraid to trespass the instruction of Yahweh? Um, this, I would contend, this is the explanation for why they were afraid. This is not content that someone is communicating. This is an explanation for the main clause. So since this is an explanation, key is going to be translated as because or for. We were afraid to trespass the law or the instruction of Yahweh because he will judge all of his servants. We were afraid to uh, trespass the instruction of Yahweh for he will. So in English, the difference between for and because... For is often used for an independent, um, uh, an independent clause, and because is used for dependent clauses. Uh, I think because sounds better here. 
So that would be the trend, uh, that would be the sort of syntax approach. Now we have to build this in English. And so well, the first thing we do is we say English, what do you want first in your sentence? English wants the subject. So I have to come in here and I have to figure out what is my main, what is my subject of the main clause? And there is no subject. None of these nouns that we saw function as the subject. So now I have to infer the subject from the form of the main verb, which was one CP. So in English, if our, if our subject is first common plural or first person plural, we would use we. So I put we down, we is our subject. All right, English, what do you want after your subject? English wants the main verb, which was uh, feared or we were afraid, okay? English, you've got your main verb, what do you want after that? Give me the rest of the predicate. Okay, so the rest of the predicate is this complementary infinitive. What were you afraid of? We were afraid to trespass. And then trespass what? The instruction of the Lord. This is the rest of the predicate right here. <coughs> so English, I'm going to give you, we were afraid to trespass the instruction of Yahweh. English, what do you want after the predicate? Give me any other modifying clauses. So now we go to our, what is probably a dependent clause here, an explanatory dependent clause, which would be because he will judge uh, and again, we don't have a subject here. You could go through that same process again for each clause. What is your subject? Well, we don't have a subject, so we have to infer it from the form of the verb. He, okay? What is the verb? He will judge. Okay, give me the rest of the predicate. Whom will he judge? He will judge all his servants. And that's when you've kind of got a polished translation is when you've really built it in English rather than simply converting all the Hebrew words to English words. If you convert all the Hebrew words to English words, you still don't have an English translation. You just have English words. Uh, it's more like code than it is language, all right? So I know that... I know that was a lot, a lot of time, a lot of information. Any questions about number three here? Um, yeah, the big question I had with that, and my, the whole translation thing, I did exactly that. And then when I checked my answer, uh, I went back and looked at my notes while you were doing some of that, was that Fatato had stative, you know, and had it as a present, you know, it's a present tense. Now, in number one, uh, Yakulti, uh, you know, to be able, I knew that was a stative thing because he kind of covered that. But then we get down to number three, and he's got it as we are afraid instead of we were afraid. And then has you know stated uh, parenthetically there, and, and I was I, I, how I didn't know how we arrived at that being stated. Yeah, um, that, that's a great question because this is not something that uh, in Greek or Hebrew this is not something that really gets covered um, because this is this isn't really a Hebrew thing. This is a linguistics thing. But what is, what does it even mean for a verb to be stated? Well, and, and here's the other problem: there are certain <laughs> verbs in Hebrew that are stated in Hebrew, but the English equivalent wouldn't need to be stated. Or for example, there are certain verbs in English that might be stative in English, but Hebrew doesn't use a stative verb to communicate that, they use an action. So it, it is tricky. What stative really means is that when you look at the verb, and again, there's no way to do this as a non-native speaker. You can't look at the Hebrew verb and ask yourself, is this describing a state of being or is this describing an action? Because the only way you can answer that question is to translate the verb into English and then ask mm -hmm. yourself, is the English verb describing a state of being or an action? <clears throat> now, there's an exception to that. There is one way, actually, that you can tell whether it's stative without translating it. And that is, in, this, in the instance of Yakol and Yahre, both of them have grammatical clues. They have morphological clues that they're stative. So Yahre has the Sere theme vowel in the perfect. Yakol has the Holum theme vowel in the perfect. <coughs> so that's how, Now, Greek doesn't do this, so it's harder in Greek. But in Hebrew, uh, this does not work for A-class statives. And for some reason, I can't think off the top of my head of an example of that. But there are some statives in Hebrew that keep the patak in the Cal perfect, even though action verbs also have the patak. Uh, but what, what you need to do at that point is if you know it's a state of verb, you just need to have in your mind, um, you just need to remember that state of verbs can be translated as present, even if they're in the perfect. That has to do with how the perfect as an aspect relates to stativity, uh, because the perfect usually as an aspect, it usually, um, it indicates, man, this is gonna get complicated. There are a lot of people who connect. <laughs> I want to say, okay, so here's what I want to say. I want to say there are a lot of people who connect the state of conjugation with, uh, sorry, there are a lot of people who connect the perfect conjugation with perfective aspect. And then there are a lot of people who connect perfective aspect with stativity. All of that is, I don't want to say controversial, but all of that is disputed to a certain degree. So um, there's not like a rule that I can give you, but the general result of all of this is that when we teach state of verbs in Hebrew, we teach that state of verbs very frequently can describe a current state, not just a past state. The reason why we translate the cow perfect or any perfect with the past tense in English is because it's a completed action. And actions in English that are completed are generally translated either with the simple past tense or with the English perfect tense. Uh, he had, um, fought. You know, a fight is an action verb. He had walked. That's the perfect. Uh, that's the past perfect. 
He has walked. That's the perfect. And then simply, he walked. All of those English translations, whether it's the simple past in English, sometimes called the preterite, um, whether it is the uh, present perfect in English, or the past perfect, sometimes called the pluperfect, all of those describe completed action that is in the past. The problem is when you're describing a state that's completed, a completed state, that's not limited to the past. Actions that are completed are limited to the past. But states, like if I say, I love my wife, the state of loving her may be complete. It may be full. It may not be growing. It may not be developing. It may be, you know, um, it may have reached its fullness. Uh, if I hate my enemy, there may, no, there may not be any development in that hatred. It's just at its full level. If I know two plus two equals four, there may be no development in that knowledge. I've already attained that knowledge. It's, it's complete. My knowledge of two plus two equals four is complete. <laughs> so we would use the perfect conjugation for all of those instances. But that doesn't mean I knew that two plus two equals four. It might also mean that I currently know. So it's, it's a roundabout explanation, but the simple rules that you would follow are that generally speaking, action verbs in the CalPerfect are going to be translated in the English past tense because a completed action is in the past. But state of verbs in the perfect conjugation can be either past or present, time-wise. Part of this has to do with the fact that the perfect and the imperfect conjugations in Hebrew really aren't about time anyways, or at least most people don't think they're about time. They're about the type of, uh, not the type of action, they're about the speaker's perspective on that action. Is it completed or is it not completed? Um, which again, can be connected to time, but it's not the same thing. So walking away from this, the conclusion would be if you have a state of verb in the perfect, a present tense English translation is an option if the context allows for it. Um, less so with action verbs, <laughs> very much less so with action verbs. So when Futado gets here to uh, Yakol, for example, Yakolti likro et ha sefer ha kadosh, this could be I was able to call, to call out uh, the Three. book. So here, uh, the word for kara, this is kind of interesting, don't over interpret this, but the reason why you use kara, which is to call out for books, has to do with the fact that this idea of reading silently, like like reading something without saying anything, that's relevant. That's relatively recent. Like the ancient world, when you read, you generally read out loud. Uh, and so we would probably translate this as read. Um, German actually has two different words uh, for reading and reading out loud. Uh, they have, uh, and I can't even remember what the prefix is that goes on one. I think it's lesen is read and auslesen is to read out. So if you're reading to your child, you're going to auslesen. But if you're reading, you know, your Bible reading for the day, you might just lesen. Well, here, kro, this is to read out in the sense of to call out. So this implies that you're reading out loud. I don't know of a Hebrew word for reading silently because I don't know if that was a thing that they did, but that's why we would use kara, which you already know kara is to call out or to say even, or uh, to, to cry maybe. So uh, he was able to read the holy book or he is able to read the holy book. There's nothing in this sentence that demands that Yakol is present or past because this could be a completed state. He could be fully able to do it right now. Um, now, in one sense, you might say that if he was fully able to do it in the past, why wouldn't he be fully able to do it? Ah, that, never mind, that's, that's a bad way to go about it. But the point is, completion of a state applies to the past or the present. Both of those are an option. Completion of an action doesn't really apply to the present. You can't really presently hit the ball presently and it be completed. If it's completed, it's over, right? Like actions that are completed are done. They're in the past. That doesn't, that's not the same for states. So that's why there's that difference there. How about another 20 minute explanation of a simple question? Does that make sense at all? Uh, it does. It actually helps. Um, but it, you know, like on a test in the translation, say number three, and I translated it to, we were afraid to I'll take, transgress. Okay. Take, I'll take either one. When it comes to statives, okay. um, those can be, and even if it's just the verb, yeah, if it's just the verb or if it's in a sentence. Now I will give you this caveat. Anytime you've got a sentence, if the context of the sentence makes it unlikely that the yeah. translation you've selected is, is like, if your translation mm -hmm. translation actually goes against the context, that's that might be a problem. Uh, now, it might be a one-point problem out of ten. It's, it's not like you're going to lose full credit for it. But that's something to, to keep in mind. If you've just got a verb with no context, then any any option is available to you. Okay. Thanks. That helps you. All right. Um, well, that's an hour-ish. <laughs> I know we started late. Um, ben, any, any questions you have that you want to go over? Um, I will plan to... Um, again, because you have the answers in Fatado, I would much rather spend time discussing your actual questions, and then if we have time, maybe reading through a little bit of the Hebrew text. So with where we're at right now, um, I would rather stick to your questions, and then if we get through those, just jump into Genesis 1-2 to kind of read through that than just read you the answers to Fatado. Uh, but I definitely want to prioritize your questions. So Ben, do you have anything you want to go over? No, I mean, most of my questions are really 
just I need to know the vocabulary better. Having trying to identify root words with all the different endings and prefixes and suffixes, and so um, I, I think I understand the infinitives. The construct state still trips me up a little bit, but I think I just need to go back and rewatch the lectures on that. Yeah, and the construct state, like I said, the good thing about that is it is literally now there are a couple weak verbs that this may not be the case, but generally speaking, the infinitive construct is simply the Cal imperfect three ms form with the prefix removed. That's why it has the shava under the first root letter is because the imperfect has the shava under the first root letter. Um, it's just that the reason for that shava is to close the prefix syllable. And so, uh, again, the the form of the infinitive construct is pretty predictable. It's, it's relatively predictable. The infinitive absolute tends to be a little less predictable sometimes. Um, and, and explaining the function of the infinitive absolute a lot of times students, because we don't have anything like it in English. There's just no parallel to connect it to. So what I usually tell students is think of the infinitive absolute you're almost never going to get the infinitive absolute but you know without some other verbal element in the sentence just think of the infinitive absolute as intensifying the verb that it's connected to so if it if it if it occurs with an imperative then it's intensifying the imperative if it occurs with um with an imperfect then it's intensifying the imperfect and the way that we usually communicate that intensification is um i don't know what examples he gave in the lesson but usually you'll go to genesis 3 um where the serpent says, you will not surely die. Like, uh, and in Genesis 2, when Yahweh gives the command, uh, he says, in the day you eat of it, dying you will die. And that dying is the infinitive absolute. Or you could read it as, in the day you eat of it, to die you will die. Well, obviously most English translations don't say, to die you will die. They say, you will surely die, you will certainly die. And so that's sort of the, the nuance of the infinitive absolute. But the infinitive absolute can be real tricky for students too, because we just don't have anything like it in English. All right, well, um, if, if there are no other questions, I saw Ryan pop in and out. Um, I should have paused to, to check with him and see if there's anything he wanted to go over. But um, if that is it, let's go ahead and jump over to Genesis 2. Or, sorry, Genesis 1, 2. And I like to think of these as just strolls. We're just going to stroll through the text, uh, see what we see, maybe do a little sightseeing. And uh, when there's stuff that we recognize, we'll celebrate that as, hey, look, you can read this. When there's stuff we don't recognize, we'll just say, oh, look, that's interesting. Maybe we'll learn about that sometime. <clears throat> but I put, I put out a video since we weren't able to do it in the actual video conference last week, going through Genesis 1-1. Uh, and that was probably a 20-minute video as well. And I want that to be indicative of how much time we spend. But um, I, I wanted to just kind of introduce the process. So we saw Breshit, that was our temporal clause. Bara Elohim, that's our verb and our subject. And then our direct objects, Hashemaim ve Haaretz. In the beginning, Elohim created the sky and the earth, or the heavens and the earth. All right, so verse 2. Let me take a look here at when we we got to be getting close to the Vav relative, right? Oh, no, we still got a few weeks. Okay. Well, then I won't bring it up. All right, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we've got Vav here. Now, we usually translate Vav as and. But you're going to find in Hebrew, like, if I just scroll down here, let's count the lines, or the verses. Let's count the verses that begin with Vav. So verse 2 begins with Vav. Verse 3 begins with Vav. I know it's a weird form. Verse 4 begins with Vav. And then here's another Vav. 5 begins with Vav. 6, 7, 8. When do we get to a sentence that doesn't begin with Vav? Oh, my goodness. Every single verse, every single verse, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Oh my goodness. Every single verse begins with Vav. So what you'll realize <coughs> is that it gets a little stale to translate the Vav as and every time. Furthermore, if you go to, uh, what is it, Halot, your lexicon. Well, you guys might have a different lexicon. Uh, I think the course recommends the concise Halot. Um, but it used to recommend uh, Brown, Driver, Briggs as well, so you may have a different one. But Halot is kind of like the academic standard for Hebrew lexicons, um, contemporary contemporary Hebrew lexicons. So if we go to the Vav, um, we're just going to see the range of meaning. It is a conjunction that joins words, phrases, clauses. Um, this is just this is just a section on the forms of Vav. So it can be a Shurik, Vav Kametz, Vav Petak, Segel, or Kametz Katuf, Vav Hirik, Vav Petak. All right, so it can mean and, like we talked about, number one, and. Number two, when connecting three or more words, Vav may precede every word except for the first. In that case, we wouldn't translate it. It can mean also or even. It can mean together with. It can be explanatory, that is, or i.e., or something like that. Uh, it can mean or in conditional phrases or in questions. It can mean or. Um, Vav before a repeated noun expresses disparity. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, whatever that means. Following a word or phrase preceded by cough preposition, it means even so. Vav, something, something, vav, would be both and. 
something as well as something else. Um, Vav connects two or more clauses. The circumstantial clause beginning with Vav represents a relative clause. So look at this. We're still going here. How many? Oh my goodness! Look at this article. Thirty different, thirty different ways you might use Vav, right? Okay. So if we jump back over here, understand you can be flexible in your translation. Now, <clears throat> once we get to the Vav relative. Um, you'll have a better idea of what's going on here. Most of your English translations translate this Vav as, uh, let's see how they translate it. Let's do a text comparison with Genesis 2. And I've just got a bunch of random text up here. But let me just do Genesis 1-2. Um, there is no and in most of these. CSB says now the earth, NIV now the earth, now the earth, the earth, and the earth, the earth, yet the earth. I guess that's all I have here. So a few different ways to translate it. The reason why they say now is because the Vav relative, which is basically this Vav, Patak, Dagesh, imperfect form, um, this is what we call, sometimes it's called the narrative preterite. Uh, it's the narrative form that, uh, what do I want to say? It's, it's not a literary device, but it's a literary feature of narrative. The action carries forward with this Vav relative plus the imperfect form. When you have a break in that, you get a Vav that is not the Vav relative here. This is beginning a new clause, but it's not vav, patak, dagesh, plus verb. It's just a vav noun. This introduces like an aside or like a parenthesis in the narrative. It's almost like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm going to give you some background information here. And then when you see the vav relative pop up again, now we're back onto the main line of the narrative. So verse 2 here is almost a parenthesis or almost background information. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth, hayata, hayata, this looks unfamiliar, but you should actually recognize this because... <laughs> this is the cow perfect 3FS form of a third hey verb. And that verb is haya. Haya means it was or it became. It came to be. And it's 3FS because the subject is ha aretz. Now, the earth was or the earth had become, perhaps, tohu vavohu. Uh, this is a Hebrew expression for a wasteland. It was uh, the idea here tohu vavohu is that it is empty, so there's no contents and void, almost like there's no existence. Uh, it was a way that the, the earth was worthless. The earth was nothing. Um, if you've heard of the gap theory, uh, it's this idea that there's a chronological historical gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. The reason for the gap theory, or one reason, I shouldn't say that, the textual uh, justification for the gap theory is translating Hayah here as became, as if to say, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth became formless and void. Well, what happened between when he created it and when it became? Well, the problem with the gap theory is it kind of mistranslates what's going on here. Uh, it assumes that the earth became is sort of like the next step, the chronological step. Like, first God created it, then it became. But if that were the case, we would expect haya to begin the sentence with a vav relative. It's the next step, uh, which would be something like uh, vayahi, and it became the earth, tohu vavohu. And that's not what we have here. This is sort of like just background information. So, the earth now, the earth was tohu vavohu. And again, you would look this up in your lexicon, but basically tohu has the idea of a wasteland. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Wilderness, emptiness. That's the idea. There's no content. And that's why it's applied to the wilderness or a wasteland. There's just nothing there, right? And then let's look at uh, vohu. What is, how is it defined vohu? Emptiness, wasteness. Um, it's all, it's almost like, uh, what do they call this? Uh, Hendiatus, maybe? Uh, it's a technique for using two terms with and to kind of communicate a singular idea. So... It's, it's basically saying that the earth was nothingness and darkness, vakoshek. We just had koshek as one of our vocabulary words. Vakoshek, al pene. So we know all, vakoshek, al, so darkness, upon or on top of, pene, tahom. Now we haven't had tahom, but we've had panim. Panim means face, and here it's the um, construct form. Now panim means face, even though it's a plural form. Uh, so here, pene also is a plural form, but it, it just means face of, to home. Now, pene doesn't just mean face, it, it means surface. You know, um, face might be sort of the core meaning, but just like you have the face of a building is really the side of a building, uh, that's kind of the idea here. So the surface of, to home. Now, I won't dig too much into this either, but to home is probably a proper noun here. Um, and, and so it's probably definite, even though it doesn't have the definite article. So that would be the, upon the surface of Tahome. And again, Tahome is usually going to be translated as the deep. Um, so the darkness was upon the surface of the deep. And again, the deep isn't just waters. The deep has sort of this cosmic, um, what primeval sort of connotation to it. Um, the... Yeah, primeval might be the best word for it. So the deep is sort of like... Um, 
this is really emphasizing the lack of content. Like, Earth really doesn't contain anything yet. Uh, Earth is, is worthless at this point. Darkness is upon the face of Tahom. The Ruach, the Ruach Elohim, I'm pretty sure we've had Ruach already. Ruach is the word for, well, a lot of things. Ruach could be wind. Ruach could be breath. Ruach could be spirit. The Ruach Elohim, so this could be the wind of God, or this could be the breath of God, or this could be the spirit of God. Uh, so this is our subject here. Now, we didn't really have a verb for the Choshek al Pane to home. There's no verb there, so that means this is a verbless clause. The Choshek is the subject, darkness upon Pane to home, darkness upon Pane to home. So darkness was upon the surface of Tahom. The Ruach Elohim, Merachefet, Merachefet, this isn't exactly a verb, this is a participle. And this participle basically means like, um, sometimes it's translated as brooding or hovering, Merachefet. So it would be something like, and Ruach Elohim was hovering Alpnei Hamayim. So here we've got sort of a parallelism. Mayim is in parallel with Tahom. Alpnei Tahom, so darkness, Alpnei Tahom, spirit of God or wind of God or breath of God, hovering Alpnei Hamayim, the waters. So again, there's no verb in Ruach Elohim, Merachefet Alpnei Hamayim. We might translate this as, and the wind of God was hovering, or hovering, is hovering. Again, there's no tense here, really. It's just, and, the, and the, the wind of God hovering upon the waters. So we would insert the to be verb was here. All right? So altogether, you get something like, remember, this is an aside. This is not necessarily chronological information. This is saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now we've got sort of a parenthesis here. The earth was tohu vavohu. The earth was a wasteland. And darkness upon the face of Tahom and spirit of God hovering upon the, wa the face of the waters. So this is almost setting the scene, like God created the heavens and the earth. Now we're gonna set the scene. Earth is a wasteland. Um, darkness upon the face of Tahom. Wind of God hovering upon the waters. Now, in verse three, we get to the next point in the narrative. And God said. So, any questions about verse two here, either grammatical or syntactical or anything? Like I said, there's only really one verb in this first clause and the rest of these are verbless, but you know a lot of what you see here. You haven't, read, you haven't run into Tahom yet. You haven't run into uh, Rachaf, which is where we get Merachefet, but all the other words here you've seen. You said that there was a pairing or a mirroring? Yeah, kind of like a, what we might call a parallelism here. We see that connection in Alpine. Those are identical. The first one we have, so basically we've got three phrases here. The first phrase is the Ha'aretz Hayata Tohu Vavohu. And then the second um, phrase, clause, would be the Choshek Alpine Tahom. And then the third one would be the Ruach Elohim Merachefet Alpine Hamaim. And what the second and the third one have in common is both of them have Vav noun, Alpine noun. So the first one is Vav darkness, Alpine Tahom. The second one is Vav Ruach Elohim, and then it adds a participle describing Elohim, or describing Ruach Elohim, and then it has Alpine Hamayim. So in these two, Tahom is parallel to Hamayim. Doesn't mean it's identical, it just means that it's, it's being put in a parallel position, and Choshek is parallel to the Spirit of God, but it doesn't mean they're the same thing, it just means they're being put into a literary parallel. So darkness was upon the face of Tahom, the, the wind of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, awesome. But yeah, you don't, I mean, again, how much you read into that, I'm just observing here, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, like, again, if you jump to the conclusion, well, if Tahom and Mayim are parallel, then we must be able to say the wind of God is darkness. Like, no, that's, that's too far. That's not what the text is saying. It's just positionally parallel is all I'm saying.